may I just open up in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the, the privilege, Lord, and the freedom that we have to come together like this of a Sunday morning, Lord, to honour you and to lift up your name and worship you. Holy Spirit, I pray that I would just be the deliverer of your word this morning and that you would do what only you can do in the hearts of each one of us. Lord, we pray that every single good seed that has ever been planted in our lives, Lord, you would nurture and water and fertilise this morning to grow that seed, to become good fruit in our lives, Lord. And Lord, I take authority over any work of the enemy that would try and distract or disturb this meeting this morning and what you want to do in Jesus' mighty name, that name that is above every name. Amen. Um, now, before I start, um, I just want to share with you a, a word that, um, or a picture actually, that the Lord gave me. And it, when the Lord um, gives me a word or a picture, what I do is I, I ask him for an opportunity or show me where to, to bring that word. Uh, if it doesn't happen, I just shelve it. And then I just leave it until the Lord shows me. And I, I did that with this picture that he'd shown me and then I actually forgot about it. And then when I was getting the word uh, together, it came back to me. So I do believe that it's for somebody here this morning, maybe even more than one person. But um, what it was, it was a picture of a bird and it had its wing out and its wings were getting clipped. And then I saw a picture of this same bird sitting in the back of a big bird cage, just sitting in the back with its wings clipped, unable to fly. And I believe that the Lord was showing me that it was symbolic of somebody here this morning, that you used to fly like this bird. You were on fire for God and you used to serve God and you used to even move in the gifts that he gave you. But something happened or life circumstances, I don't know what it was, that caused the enemy to, to clip your wings, so to speak. And you're like that bird now sitting back in that bird cage. The actual door was open of the bird cage, just sitting there thinking, unable to fly. But I believe that the Lord's saying that time has passed, your wings have grown back. And that if you would dare to step out of that birdcage, that you will not only fly again, but you will soar to greater heights than you were before or you did before. Now, if that's you, if that resonates with you and you want, you know, to stand with, in prayer, we'll give you an opportunity um, after the message and uh, there'll be somebody to pray with you over that. Now, we're in Exodus. I'm loving this Exodus journey. And we're doing uh, chapter 16 today and I'm going to read totally off my notes because if I don't, I'll go off onto some tangent and I'll be over the Gateway Bridge before you can catch me and bring me back. So um, I'm just going to read off the notes and I'm just going to recap a little bit on, on chapter 15. And we go where the Lord had parted the Red Sea. He had delivered the Israelites from their enemies They'd walked over dry ground, he'd killed all the Egyptians and he'd placed the sea back to where it was. What a sight that would have been. It would have been amazing to see, wouldn't it? And today the unbelievers and scientists or whatever tried to explain that away with some really quite crazy uh, explanations. But we know the Lord God of Israel performed that miracle parted the Red Sea and saved his people. And the Israelites knew that it was God that had saved them because once they had arrived on the other side, they all started singing songs and praising God. Miriam got out the tambourines with all the women. Karen, I could see you with the tambourines up there. <laughs> praising the women, uh, with the women and singing and dancing to God. There were great celebrations to thank the Lord for what he had done in saving them. Some of the words that they were singing were, The Lord is my strength and song. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? All the inhabitants of Canaan will melt away. Fear and dread will fall on them. 
by the greatness of our arm, of your arm, sorry, they will be as still as a stone. Till your people pass over, O Lord, till the people pass over whom you have purchased, you will bring them in and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance, in the place, O Lord, which you have made for your own dwelling, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord shall reign forever. I mean, they were singing songs. They were singing about the nations going to be afraid. Once they hear of this, all the nations will be afraid. God was bringing them into their inheritance, um, that they knew that it was God the place that God had made, they were faith-filled words, faith-filled songs. You know, and how easy it is to praise the Lord when things are going well, isn't it? We're full of faith. It's easy to utter faith-filled words when God is visibly and tangibly doing things in our lives, isn't it? We'd love to just set up camp and stay there, wouldn't we? But these people of God were on their way to a promised land a place God had destined for them. Just as we are destined for a place promised by God. And I'm sure we can expect some of the same lessons as we go. It would have been lovely to stay and bask in the victory the Lord had just given them. But God was not going to let them dwell there. They had to keep moving. It was a wonderful time of celebration, singing, dancing, the praises to God. And how they thanked him for his his mighty protection and deliverance. But it wasn't to last long. Well, not very long at all, really. After three days, oh no, sorry, God was about to reveal whether the faith-filled words they were singing and proclaiming out of their mouths in the good times would really line up with what was in their hearts in the testing times. And these people were about to be tested. They were about to move from an atmosphere of miracles, signs and wonders to what we know as a wilderness experience. You know, Ross and I got, marri- uh, got um, saved, we got married too, but we got saved in the early 90s, and, um, uh, 1991 actually, 91. And uh, around that time there was a real move of God happening. Um, some of you might remember it. It was around, you know, Pensacola, Brownsville time, all that was going on. And I actually, I personally saw things uh, that I couldn't deny were not God. There were things happening. And God was, was really moving. But it seemed to stop. It, it passed over. And many Christians had trouble with that, that the fact that there was nothing happening. And what And they wanted to stay in that place. I mean, it was a great place. It was exciting, you know, and there were, you did see things. It was a feel-good experience. But, with the signs and wonders. But um, what happened was that because they found it difficult that it it wasn't continuing, they started to manufacture stuff to keep it going. And I was actually gobsmacked at some of the stuff that I was seeing and hearing, you know, um, from Christians, um, but God was still working. He, he had just moved on and he was just doing a different type of work. I believe that he was doing a deep work in people's hearts, but it wasn't visible like it had been. Mm-hmm. And when God moved in the wilderness, the Israelites had to move with him and we need to learn to move when God moves. If we want the power and the miracles and the signs and wonders, we also have to accept times where it feels like there is nothing happening and God is a million miles away. But we can be sure that God is still working. Like that song that we sing, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never. Don't worry, Terry, I'm not going to sing. <laughs> I'll never live that down, that song for communion. <laughs> yeah. But usually in, it's um, in those times of wilderness walking, of testing and dryness, that we see if we really do believe the faith words that we speak. Moses led Israel into the wilderness of Shur. 
And it only took three days of looking for water and finding no water that they started complaining. And the water that they did find was bitter. And so God provided another miracle for them. He got Moses to throw the branch into the, into the water and it became sweet and drinkable. Uh, verse 25 in Exodus 15 it says, so he cried out to the Lord and the Lord showed him a tree and when he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made a statute and an ordinance for them and there he tested them and said, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes I will put none of the diseases on you which I have wrought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. God did test them, and He commanded them to follow His. Uh, he, he wanted them to, or teaching them to follow His commandments, to obey Him. And He said, "You know, if you obey Me, all things will go well for you." And God still today asks us to follow His commandments and obey Him, because there are consequences for not doing so. And some of us have felt those consequences, haven't we? So even after God performed miracles of deliverance, miracles of provision, and brought them out of bondage and slavery, he was saying, don't take all this for granted. Don't think that you can just start living how you want to with sin in your lives and get away with it like you have no Lord over over you. Or you will end up in the same boat as the Egyptians. So we move to chapter 16. Of Exodus. And they journeyed from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they departed and from the land of Egypt. Then the whole congregation of the Israel of, uh, children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. That is a lot of murmuring because there was a lot of, there was over two million people. <laughs> And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died in the hand, by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, where we sat by the pots of meat and when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. You know, provisions had or were obviously running out. They'd been out there a couple of months and they started to complain again. You know, complaining really distorts our perception of our problems. It always makes the problem look far worse than it is. They looked back and it looked better. They'd forgotten a few minor details that back in Egypt, they were getting flogged, the Romans were harsh, the slave labour was nearly killing them, but they remembered sitting by the pots of stew. At the first sign of distress... They started confessing God had taken them out into the wilderness to kill them. No matter that God had just opened the sea and saved them, killed all their enemies, and they were praising him for it only five minutes before. You know, when we think about it, if God wanted to kill them, he could have just let the Romans do it. They were backed up to the sea. Yeah, the Egyptians, sorry, do it. Um, They were backed up to the sea, so he could have just let them do it. But no, they started to focus more on their problem than what their sovereign God had just done for them. Have you ever done that? Get yourself so focused on your problem and your situation that you've forgotten the numerous times God has brought you through the tough times. I have. And despite their murmurings, their grumblings, which God hears, by the way, Despite their disobedience, despite their lack of faith, you know, God could have said to them, right, I've had you lot, I've had you wine and lot, I've, I've saved you from the Romans, I've provided food and water for you. Uh, sorry, I keep on saying the Romans, the Egyptians. And I've provided food and water for you and all you've done is complain. He could have called down fire and consumed them. But instead, let's see what he did. In verse 4, then the Lord said to Moses, behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day 
that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. And it shall be on the sixth day that they shall prepare what they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. Then Moses and Aaron said to all the children of Israel, At evening you shall know that the Lord has brought you out of Egypt, and in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, for he hears your murmurings against the Lord. But what are we that you murmur against us? Also Moses said, This shall be seen when the Lord gives you meat in the evening, in the morning bread to the full, for the Lord hears your murmurings which you make against him. And what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. Moses was saying, we didn't bring you out here into the wilderness. It was God that brought you out. We're just the leaders. You know, we've got to be very careful who we complain and gripe about. Because we might think that we're complaining about a person, but we could very well be complaining about God or murmuring against God. So loving God, our loving God, rained down food from heaven upon them, providing manna and quails to feed them. What a merciful father he was, or he is. Verse 12 tells us that I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. Speak to them, saying, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am your God. So it was that quails come up at evening and covered the camp and in the morning the dew lay all around the camp. And when the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a small round substance as fine as frost on the ground. So that when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, this is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. So God bought the... the, the, uh, ground was covered with quail because they wanted meat and in the morning the ground was covered with the bread and yes he was their provider he provided everything for them that they needed and even though God bought the food and virtually placed it at their feet they still had a responsibility to gather and prepare the food in accordance to God's directions just as we can't sit back and do nothing and expect God to just drop what we need in our laps. He expects us to do our bit. Verse 16. It explains the requirements that they had concerning and the instructions concerning the manna. This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Let every man gather in according to each one's need. One omer, which each person, according to the number of persons, let every man take for those who are in the tent. And then it goes on to explain they had to gather one omer, which I, I worked out was just over a kilo, but if I'm wrong, someone can correct me on that, for every person in their tent, every day. That's a lot of manna. He told them not to get more and hoard it for the next day or it would stink and breed worms, which they didn't take notice of and that's, that happened. Some ate more, some ate less and it averaged out to exactly what they needed. There was exactly enough. You know, when we totally trust God as our provider, there will always be enough. When I was over in um, Mozambique with Heidi Baker, uh, their, their, their motto over there everywhere, on every door, if you see it, is Jesus is enough. And she even wrote a book called Always Enough. And some of the stories that, uh, you know, she told was just absolutely amazing. You know, how they, uh, they, they made her um, uh, leave the town where she was under duress. I mean... Uh, it was quite dangerous for them. And the kids from the orphanage uh, followed them and found them. And when they had arrived, Heidi and her husband, the lady next door had just given them a little pot of stew for her and her husband. And then not long after that, a few hours after that, there was 50-odd children plus turned up at the door. And she was like, Lord, how am I going to feed all these kids? That little pot of stew fed everyone and there was more left over. And so they know that you know, they know that provision, that God is their provider because they see it over and over again. But if they were lazy, they missed out. They had to get up early in the morning. Otherwise, the sun melted, melted it. And on the sixth day, 
there was double the amount they had to get for Sabbath the next day. God had it all under control. And in verse 4, as we said, he was testing them, that I may test them. Well, what was he testing them for? In Deuteronomy 8, it says, And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you could keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you and allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he may make known that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He was humbling them. He humbled them. He tested them to know what was in their hearts. And he was teaching them that man does not live by bread alone. Number one, he was humbling them. He was humbling them to drive the pride of self-sufficiency out of them. He caused them to rely on him for their everyday needs, their very existence. When we think we don't need to depend on God, when we think we don't need to obey him, it's pride. And you know what God thinks of pride. He was also, he was showing them what was in their hearts. There were words of faith and praise when things were going well. But those words turned to faithless, faith, faithless words, hopeless confessions when things got tough. And I can relate to that sometimes. That he was also teaching them. Uh, sorry, God will take us into the wilderness and test us and even humble us if he has to to show us what's really in our hearts. He was testing them that God and showing them, teaching them that God may, uh, cannot live by bread alone. The provision of manna was to satisfy their physical hunger, but every person has a spiritual hunger, a hole in our soul that only spiritual manna can fill. He was teaching them that the word of God is the manna by which their souls would be nourished. God's word and their obedience to it was just as essential to their spiritual life as food was to their physical life. And the tests were teaching them that. Just because we are under grace and not law, don't think that God won't test our obedience and our faith today. He does. You know, even preparing this message... um, about relying and trusting on God to provide words lining up with our faith. I had planned to get the message done early in the week. So, (laughs) you know, just in case anything happened at the end of the week. Um, But as it turned out, everything happened right through the week, uh, every day. Um, Just things out of my control. And I just couldn't get, the, get it done. I couldn't find the time to get this word done. Everything was happening. And uh, I could feel myself getting anxious, you know, and thinking, God, I've got to get this word done. And, and I'd, I'd committed it to the Lord. Lord, this is your faith words. This is your word, Lord. This is your message. I'm just delivering it, you know. But I could find myself getting anxious. Um, I even, we put off a uh, a 60th wedding anniversary last night and I thought, all right, I'll sit down and I'll do it, you know, last night. Didn't happen. So this morning I was still (laughs) there writing out. It's one you didn't see me writing as I'm walking through the door. But, you know, I... It was, it was like that. It really was. You know, people that, that you know, they give a word know that. Um, and, but while I was, you know, sitting there thinking about it, it dawned on me that I was being tested on the very thing that I was preaching. You know, I had, as I said, I dedicated to Lord. Did I think he wasn't going to come through? Did I think that he wasn't going to give me the, the message? I knew he was deep down, but I could feel, you know, that anxiety coming up. Um, So he will test us in any way. That's why, you know, it's dangerous to be prideful, maybe even act more spiritual than we are. We may just find ourselves in a place of testing. He will test us just as he did the Israelites. And, you know, we might say, well, well, that was in the Old Testament, you know. They were under the law. But the Old Testament is a shadow of the new, pointing to a future 
where the manna raining down from heaven was no longer going to be wafers that kept them physically alive, but God sent us today his living bread. His living bread. I'm going to just read to you John 6, 32. And Jesus said himself, Most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives, uh, gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Um, Stu, could I just get you? Yeah, thank you. Do you know, we have been given the living bread that keeps us alive spiritually. Not just day to day, like the manna in the wilderness, but for all eternity. In verse 33, we just read, For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus is that life. Without him, we are spiritually dead and separated from the Father. You know, if you have not received Jesus as your living bread, I encourage you to make that decision today. Don't leave it any longer. He is our living bread. He is our manna that was given from heaven. And just as they fed on the manna daily in the wilderness, we would do well to feed on our living bread, Jesus, every